Hi, today we're going to talk about IoT and the data challenges that come with storing the types of data which IoT creates. Everywhere we look today, we see devices and machines that create billions of data points every day. Devices like smartphones and smart appliances, or machines like autonomous cars and wind turbines, are creating data faster than the world has ever seen before. And each of these points needs to be stored somewhere, somewhere that both users and operators can access in a relatively small amount of time. Two main challenges that come with storing this amount of data are, one, how do we process and store this ever-growing amount of data, and two, how to store this data efficiently so that we can make it easy to retrieve and perform analytics. We can think of an IoT system as being divided into three main areas. One, devices, two, IoT hub, and three, business insights. We need a way to manage our devices. This includes device registration, device state management, and data collection. In Cassandra, these can be simple tables to keep track of the device, its properties, and its state. What about complex devices that are made up of tens or hundreds of other devices? How do we understand the relationships between these devices? This is where DSC Graph can help. DSC Graph is designed to handle the relationships between complex and constantly changing data, perfectly suited to make sense of connections in real time to deliver instantly actionable insight and superior experiences. Processing high-velocity data is never easy, especially if we want to create alerts and notifications against assigned thresholds and limits. DSE Analytics incorporates Spark Streaming, which allows you to consume live data streams from sources including Akka and Kafka. This data can then be analyzed by Spark applications, checking those thresholds and limits, creating alerts and notification if needed, and then storing the data in the database. This can be done in the central IoT hub, or it can be done at remote gateways so that the raw data stays at the remote areas. In this case, the central hub will only be sent summary data to conserve bandwidth and data processing. If needed, the central hub can always inspect the data at the field gateways or edge devices. The main role of the central hub is to store the data efficiently for both collection and retrieval. This is an arduous task, and most databases were not designed to be able to handle the scale and speed of the data in IoT systems. As you may already know, Cassandra and Datastax were designed to handle large amounts of data across many commodity servers, providing high availability and predictable scalability with no single point of failure. So no matter how fast and big the data becomes, the database will always be able to scale to accommodate the load. Cassandra stores data in a columnar structure and this is perfect for time series type data, which IoT devices produce. An example of a time series efficient table would be the following. Okay, so in this example, we're gonna create a table called device data. Uh, as you can see, it has uh, an ID column of text, a time is timestamp, a value is an int, but here's the key part, is the primary key. Notice we have the ID is our partition key and time is a clustering column. Key thing here is with clustering order by time descending, right? So if you think about time series data, this actually works really well because the data will be pre-ordered into the essentially latest piece of data at the, at the top. And here is a concrete example of then how to insert data into the table that we just created. In Cassandra, we try to keep the partition size down to a max of 100 megabytes of data or 100,000 rows. In this case, the partition is the device itself, so we will keep all of the values associated with this device on the same partition. This design is obviously dependent on the data in the rows and is a quick guideline. To achieve this, if we suspect the data will get larger than these limits, we change the data model to incorporate a bucket into the partition key. This bucket can be something simple like a day or a month. For example, if we were getting one value for each sensor every minute, we would expect to have every sensor to have 1,440 values each day. After 70 days, this volume will exceed the guideline for the partition size. If we want to keep less than 70 days worth of data, we can simply delete it when it's no longer needed. If we want to keep this data for longer, let's say five years, we can introduce a bucket of year month to the partition key to ensure a maximum of 31 days belongs to one partition. So the change data model might look something like this. So here's an example of our modified data model adding in the new bucket. So here you can see we have, again, our ID of text, but take a look at what happened to our primary key. Notice now we have both ID and year month creating a composite partition key, and time is still our clustering column. 
And here are some concrete examples of some insert statements for our new data model. Now notice the difference in our select statement, where here we're not only selecting from ID, but we're also selecting from ID and year month because that forms our composite partition key. Collecting data can be very different than retrieving it. When collecting data, we are usually collecting millions of points from thousands or millions of devices. When querying, we are usually requesting the data for one device over a certain period of time. This allows us to perform some optimizations on long-term storage if needed. So for example, older data can be stored in a warm compressed state with extremely fast retrieval times, while recent data can be held the way it's collected in the hot store. For example, we collect one value per minute for our sensors. When analyzing these values, the minimum granularity we look at is one day. In most cases then, it would be advisable to move all the data points for a day into a single compressed field, like a single column value or cell. After the data is collected in any format like bytes, JSON, or Java serializable. This allows data from a specific day to be retrieved by reading just one field, which can be extremely performant in the query while also reducing the historical data footprint. Now here's an example of a table using this technique. Notice again, we have our ID column, our year month, but now the key difference is the measurements column that we've added that'll either store data from our bytes, JSON object, or Java serializable in the measurements field. And again, we have some concrete insert statements here that give you some examples of how it might look when inserting data into this table. Retrieving the daily data to store it in a compressed fashion also gives us a chance to sample values, compute statistics, or aggregate data in a way that may be useful at a higher level. These calculated aggregates may include the number of values per day, the sum of values, and maybe the average per day, per week, or per month, for example. Purging data is always an important part of any database, and Cassandra and DataStax have some tools to help here. First is the time to live feature, which tells the database to delete the data after a certain amount of time. We can also use the power of Spark's distributed engine to concurrently process the delete jobs. This can be done as part of a batch job that offloads the data to cold storage and removes the data from the hot or warm layer. The data tiering aspect is also very important from a cost of ownership point of view. We want data to be moved through hot to cold storage as the data becomes less valuable to the system. An example would be to use Cassandra as a hot real-time layer to process, analyze, and collect the data. The warm layer would store a compressed version along with statistics and summary data, again in Cassandra. As the data ages, it would be compressed further and stored in files or compressed structures in cheap storage such as Hadoop or a data warehouse. The insights produced from a system are only as good as the data that is available, so ensuring that data is relevant and easily available is essential. Technologies like machine learning and AI are becoming more mainstream, and the key ingredient to both of these is data. Spark SQL allows us to get data from all of the different storages at once, allowing us to easily combine new and old data. This is typical of a modern Lambda architecture. Another point to consider is the use of AI and machine learning as a service. More vendors are offering services where customers use these platforms and simply bring their data to the service. Typical examples are image classification and object detection. Getting your big data sets close to these platforms can be key in taking advantage of them. But what if we are decided on a cloud vendor that doesn't have the services that you require? Or maybe they offer the service, but you know now that another vendor has a more efficient algorithm for your use case. The need to have flexibility in data sets will be key in taking advantage of this platform.